Hello everyone, Rev Brad back after a month off and with you here today on Soccer Chaplains United's podcast from the Touchline. Today I'm joined in a special phone interview with Ben Dudley. Ben is a longtime friend and he is one of the volunteer co-chaplains for the Portland Timbers and he's part of Soccer Chaplains United. We cover a number of things in today's episode, including how the Timbers are beloved in Portland and what it feels like for athletes in the midst of the unrest and tension we've seen in the Pacific Northwest. So hold on, we'll be back before you can fell a tree and yell timber. He's found the space, and he's found the back of the net! Just a little off foot, thinking he's going to go far post. Not strong enough with his right hand. Whips that one in. Far post, almost made him in, and they have! He has the hat trick! The second in his career! The third of the night! The hat trick hero! Talked about you're not going to be able to sustain that kind of pressure. To the corner, goes towards the near post, and you're the angle, and what a goal! What a goal! Today on the podcast, I have a special friend and guest, Ben Dudley. Ben is volunteer co-chaplain for Major League Soccer's Portland Timbers, and is vice president field operations and executive director in Portland at the Positive Coaching Alliance. Not only does he do all that, Ben actually composed and produced our podcast opening and closing music. He is such a talented guy. Welcome to the Touchline, Ben. Hey, thanks, Brad. It's always fun to get to chat with you, and I'm excited. I think this is my first time on the podcast, so here we go. Oh, oh don't, don't, uh, don't kill me for that. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, like there's no, just, man, it's so just much nice that's to, been going nice on. Nice to be invited. Is all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> excited. <laughs> Oh, Ben, we've known each other for a long time now. It's been, what's it been, like 10 years? 10 years, yeah, this summer, yep. And, and in that's fact, actually I, kind of... I remember, Brad, it was actually in July, I was in Colorado, and I had reached out, and I was like, hey, I'm moving to Portland, looking to get involved maybe with the Timbers, and I, I, I mean, you were kind of like, who is this guy? What is this guy? Who is this guy? What, what's he doing? I, I remember that when you called, though, you told me that you were in a van down by the river and, and you were driving <laughs> through <laughs> to Portland. And I Pretty was like, much. how does this guy get my number? How does he know me? Uh, no. But, well, Ben, talk a little bit about that. What what was going on? Actually, I think that was like 11. Wasn't that 2009? No. It, you were moving so we to moved to Portland in, in 2010. So, yeah. 2009 and then um, and 10 is kind of when it all went down. We moved in 10, but yeah, the end of 2009 is when um, I really, I mean, really felt like God was speaking to us to to kind of end our season in in Texas and and seek out um, a new adventure. And um, yeah, so it's a pretty crazy story, Brad. If I think back like to 2009, it was the fall and. And I got a call from my buddy who lived in Dallas, and he said, hey, um, there's this guy named John Burns who I really want you to meet. He does this soccer chaplain stuff over in with the Premier League, and he does this international soccer thing, and you just are going to love him. You got to meet him. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I'm, I love soccer. And, I, you know, so, so they drove from Dallas down to Waco, and he, and he kept saying, like, hey, Ben, you need to get John to preach at your church. And I'm like, well, you know, we don't have a lot of guest speakers and whatever. He's like, no, you have to have John. I promise you have to have John speak. And so kind of reluctantly, having never met the guy, but like I trusted my buddy Dave. And I was like, okay, mm-hmm. Dave, if you're saying we need to have this guy speak, you know, we do have an opening. Like, let's have him have a Sunday. And so this John Burns guy shows up in the town and we go have coffee for like an hour. And I was just like really inspired within that hour of like, man, this guy is like really figured out a way to, to, and he always talked about like harnessing the power of like what you're passionate about and using it for God. And so like within that hour at the coffee shop, I was just like, wow, like, am I doing that? Am I living my fullest life that God has intended for me? Or am I just kind of going through the motions? Well, we have that hour and then we get to church and um, he gets up to start speaking and I mean, it was just one of those moments where, you know, you can just feel like um, the person speaking right to you. And I, I don't, I can probably count those moments in my life, like probably like two or three times where I just feel like this is directly 
God's communicating directly to me right now. And that was one of them. And, and I just sensed and knew that God was telling me that I needed to do something different. I didn't have an answer of what it was, but I knew I needed to listen. And immediately following the sermon, I was like talking to our congregation and, and John went into the office, um, our church office. And, and my wife was just sitting in my office and he just kind of walked in and said, are you Ben's wife? And she's like, yeah. And she, and he had never met her. And he's like, man, I just want you to know, I really like this guy. And I can just sense that there's something going on with you guys. I don't know what it is, but God's t- saying to me that something's going on. And, and if you need a place of refuge, if you need a place to go to figure it out, like you can come to Middlesbrough and stay with our family or whatever you need. Like, wow, we have like, I can, I just know something's going on. And Janie was taken back, uh, started crying. We get home. She tells me about it. I start crying. Like I call him up that night and I'm like, John, I'm ready. Like, you're right. Like we need to, we got to do something like something's going on. We need to change. We need to, um, to step out in faith and, and go out and do something. And, and I was like begging him for a job in Africa in South Africa with like this, with his lion draw ministry. And he's like, Nope, I don't yeah. have a job for you. I just have a refuge mm. for you. And, and it, um, it just like opened up my mind to be available to say, okay, God, where do you want us? And, and I just remember we pulled out a map and, of the world and we kind of thought we'd been doing some work in Kenya. There was South Africa. There was New York City. There was Kansas City. There was Portland. Like we were looking everywhere and San Diego and through just a, you know, a series of prayers and thoughts and, um, God just pretty quickly like kind of put it us, um, pointed us to Portland and um, yeah, that was late October. And by January we had officially announced our, you know, we were leaving our church and by, by May we took a sabbatical and we moved to Portland August 1st, 10 years ago. So we're coming up on 10 years. So, so you spin the globe, you open up the Rand McNally USA (laughs) travel Atlas and you exactly put your finger what we down did. with your eyes closed, and you, you trade dry Texas, dry, dusty Texas, for uh, rainy, green Portland, Oregon. And and all because the Spirit yeah. came and, and spoke in your church, basically. No, wow. I mean, and part of it, like why we picked Portland is um, we're obviously not from Oregon. We're, we're I've been Texan. My wife grew up in Oklahoma. Um we just wanted to go somewhere where we felt like we had an affinity for the culture. So, uh, cause the way we do ministry, we really try to, uh, invest in and engage in, in the culture that's, and try to be, um, participating in the bringing the king, like participating in bringing the king of God to life within wherever we are. And, and to go to New York felt like, uh, we'd be, take five to 10 years to figure it out. And, and there was something about Portland, like there's a soccer city, USA people were like, it's bike crazy. And I'd been riding my bike in Texas for like two years. I'd sold my car and just been commuting on my bike. I was a pescatarian and food and like environmentalism is a big deal here. Um, we just felt like that we could kind of show up here and not, kind of and, and not feel out of place and really feel like we would connect with people. And um, we were right. I think we, we landed in a place with kind of similar shared values. And then we just have been able to try to say what inspires us to think that way, which is our understanding of the gospel and of Jesus. Whereas some people it's just cause I want to be a good person. Right. So, that's the way we kind of dove into the city was to try to, to do that intentional ministry. Yeah. And, and early on, I I remember our conversations were around connecting into this team that uh, the city of Portland just had a great affinity and love for the Portland Timbers were part of the, the premier sort of Northwest Pacific um, rivalry that was going on. You, you had the, the Seattle Sounders, you had Portland Timbers. They weren't quite in major league soccer yet. Um, I forget if the, there was still the team in Vancouver at that point, but you, you had these 
yep. sort of this trifecta there in the Pacific Northwest. And the Timbers were are just beloved. I mean, people were crazy for the Timbers, even though they weren't sort of in that top echelon of of soccer yet in the U.S. They were they were on the doorstep of coming in. Um, say more about that. Say more about uh, you know just even. Uh, I mean, I I remember vaguely where I was sitting in my house when that phone call came through, and and you were uh, you were driving through on your way to Portland, but. Talk about the Timbers in those early days, and uh, you know what what did that look like for you? Uh, you know, soccer in Portland dates back to you know 1975 is when the Portland Timbers were first a part of. Um, they had their team, and I don't I don't even remember if it was the uh, what the league was called back then. Um, but you know, I know Pele played like his last professional game in, in, um, well, I think it was called civic stadium back in the day, like in, in, in Portland got dubbed soccer city USA. And there was like different iterations of the timbers throughout the years. They kind of, the league folded. And then a friend of mine actually, um, bought the, the rights of the name and, and kept the team going and they tried to start another league and that folded um, and then the USL days came along and, and the Timbers came back and, and they did have this rivalry with the Sounders and, and Vancouver. Um, and they call it like the Cascadia rivalry, Cascadia cup. And, um, but when I came, like it was right when MLS was launching. So I, I actually participated and, and did some chaplain work the last season of the USL team time. Um, I, I got here in August and that season ended in November. So I worked with some guys for a couple months then and just seeing like the buzz. I mean, we were already averaging like 14,000 fans at USL matches. Um, and so, you know, it just went and the stadium was only 20,000 seats. So, you know, it didn't take much to sell out and there was 10,000 people on the waiting list to get seats and, you know, they renovated the stadium and it was just like, all anybody was talking about, thinking about was Timbers, Timbers, Timbers. And, and, um, the Timbers army is one of the best supporters groups around the country. Um, really always been um, a huge part of the city. And a big part of it is because they, they're not just, they really buy into the idea of like club country community. And, and, and so they do so much, um, community work, um, and volunteerism through the, um, through the one Oh sevenist organization. Um, so it's really about like, um, it's a, it's a part of the, the cultural identity of our city, um, is, is our fan group and supporting the club. And it's like, it's a really big, important part of, of what makes Portland Portland. Yeah. You know, you, you have this knack, um, Ben does whenever we have a new chaplain come on board for soccer chaplains United, Ben sends this picture of a, <laughs> a, a fairly burly man with, um, lumberjack, uh, clothing on and a hard hat and a very long chainsaw. It's actually quite uh, frightening sometimes. Um, but what, what an atmosphere, what an environment. Uh, if, if anyone's ever been to a Portland Timbers game, it's, it's one of the best soccer atmospheres that we have in the U.S., I think, in my opinion. And, and tell us about Timber Joey, though, and who he is, kind of how this started as a mascot and some of the in-game things that he does that, you know, if someone's watching a game on TV or, or if they go in person uh, to a Portland Timbers game, what, what, who is Timber Joey and, and what, uh, what should one expect? Well, and I mean, Timber Joey is amazing, but, and there's a lot of people who know a lot more of the history and can tell you the story about Timber Jim who came before Joey more than I can. But I, I mean, I know a little bit to tell you, I mean, basically this, this guy they, who, so he was dubbed Timber Jim he was at a, at a match and was kind of wanting to figure out a way to get the fans riled up. And he asked permission if he could bring his chainsaw in. And at first they're like, no, you're crazy. He's like, no, trust me. Like just let me bring my chainsaw to the match. I'll, I won't have a bladed chain or whatever you call it. And, and so they like, I don't know if they were reluctantly letting him or if they were excited to let him in, but they let him in. And he just started like 
getting people pumped up and cheering and revving the chainsaw, like an important part of the match. But then the stadium was also a baseball stadium and out in uh, center field, there were these really tall telephone poles um, and like logged out and, and I don't know what they're called, but um, out in the outfield. And during the match, he had his, um, his timber stuff and he like goes and, and, climbs up this pole and stands up at the top of it. You got to Google a picture of this thing. It's incredible. And he's like revving his chainsaw. He's standing, he's probably 60, 80 feet in the air, yards in the air. I mean, I don't know how tall this thing is. It's, it's crazy. Just <laughs> balancing on the top, revving up his chainsaw. And you're like, you look out, like there's no way anybody would get away with that now. But, um, <laughs> and it like just created this culture of like, um, um, you know, a timber, timber gym. And then when, when MLS started, uh, I think he retired and, and they, and they found another, I mean, Joe is just the best. I mean, he, he loves to, I mean, he really genuinely like loves people, loves kids, loves to, to give to the community. You'll see him at everything that there, there is going on. He's just the ultimate volunteer, um, and supporter, um, and he's just really carried the identity of our, of our club forward. And I think one of the things that makes it work so well here is, um, Portland really, um, loves to think of itself as like authentic and having a real person represent their club instead of like, um, a cartoon mascot means a lot to our, our town. And I'm not trying to knock other mascots because, that's part of it. And kids love the big cuddly bears and whatever, but like having this physical person that's like, you know, represents the heart of Oregon, like, you know, timber and um, it just means a lot. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, um, it's an important part of the identity of, of, of our team for a lot of reasons. Um, But Joey, I mean, if you just know him as a human, he's just, um, He's a beautiful person, and, and he does so much for our city and for the identity of the club. Yeah, no, for sure. You know, one, watching uh, watching Timber Joey or Timber Jim gets the sense of, um, I mean, he helps, as you said, really complete and move that identity forward, uh, just given Oregon's background in the logging industry and, and, and probably to some effect, let, let's be honest, I mean, Colorado Rapids, uh, how do you how do you make a mascot out of like rapids? I mean, I, when I <laughs> when I worked for the club, everybody was like, "Oh, is that a whitewater rafting company you work for?" And it was like, "No, it's the local professional soccer team." And you know, we, we've we've gone through our iterations of mascot. We've had uh, they call him a toothpaste head. You know, he he's this sort of blue figure with with white crest waves on top of his head and and the i think in the more recent iteration we've actually had four mascots that kind of made a play into some of the endangered species animals in colorado the bald eagle and some of these other things and and i forget i i think uh finances we've 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 cut back from four back down to one or two uh mascots alone but really hard to to craft a consistent identity sometimes for teams and and I, I think, uh, you know, Portland's one of the teams that, that has sort of a, a really complete sense of that. And, you know, Ben, maybe speak a little bit to uh, Portland history and Portland culture. I know that in the times when I've visited the city and spent time with you, you've, you've shared a bit with me about Portland's past and its origins, its history, how it got started as a city. Uh, share a little bit about how – how Portland from, from as you've learned and and grown and, and you and your family have kind of um, become adopted and and grafted into this new, new city, this culture. Uh, What is that history and and how does that play into uh, the timbers and even, even some of what's going on today culturally? So what's really interesting about the way Oregon was founded, the things I've read and, and learned about is like, it was actually started with the intent of kind of creating this white utopia. I mean, from my understanding is um, black people, people of color weren't allowed to live in the state. And when it was upon like it's founding documents or creeds or whatever it was like charter, I mean, it was, you're not allowed in. And, and then throughout 
time and as the war was going on, they needed um, help building ships. And so they basically brought in people of color um, and, and a large um, a large amount of those people were black people to come and they wouldn't let them live in Portland. They created this other little town called Vanport um, for people to live in. Um, Vanport, down, like it ended up flooding, like completely just wiping it out. Like it does not exist now. And so you had um, thousands upon thousands of people displaced and there are people of color who could not find another place to live. So then Portland created hmm. uh, what a lot of cities did is had like the red line district where they created boundaries where people of color could live. And if any businesses or realtors rented to pe- um, people of color outside of these spaces, um, they weren't allowed, you know, they would be um, essentially like blackballed in the community. And, and so, you know, from our very origins, like we have, um, had an, a very ugly history and and Oregon is I mean we're in in Native American country like so there are so many different Native American um, tribes and groups that are um, you know from in the Pacific Northwest and so not only did we come in and occupy and, and take over land that wasn't ours but then we treated it and I say we I mean European Americans white people um, treated it as if it was theirs and and we're um, it's an ugly part of our history it's an ugly part of our of our American history but racial tensions have been high in Portland since I've lived here I mean there's been tensions between the black community and police um, there's been um, uh, unlawful um, police killings of black um, Portlanders for years this has been something that's been going on Um and and now you you see the escalation of this manifest itself in uh, with George Floyd. Portland is on like day sixty of of protests where the city has. I mean, literally every night at five o'clock, if you drive down a certain street, there's groups of people, even during a, a pandemic, who are lining the streets with Black Lives Matter signs, like trying to show support and protest to try to advocate for change. So what's really fascinating, I think, about Portland is. You have a history, but the history is a, it doesn't define what we're trying to be. And so I think while there is this like quest to create this utopic place, and I think that's still a part of Portland culture, and I'm not sure everybody would agree, but, but I think it is. Like, I think our government in Portland, our city, they spend probably more on creating bike lanes than they do on education. I mean, it's insane. Like, there's just, because bike lanes are utopic and it's like, well, if we all rode our bikes then our environment would be better and we would all be healthy. And, and so we just, um, and I'm all for it. I, I love the bike, but I think we get so caught up in trying to create these idealistic things that, um, we just have a lot of special interest groups, if you will. Like there's all these little niche things that end up, um, keeping our, our city from really taking larger steps. Cause sometimes when you take larger steps as a city, um, you have to, um, essentially like you can't, you can't give every single group what they want. Um, but Portland, so part of, I think creating this utopia culture is we're going to advocate and protest and, and, and rep and try to reconcile our past. And, and if we have a racist past, in Oregon, then I think there's a real reason why, at least in Portland, and people are trying to acknowledge that and trying to be better and move past that. Um, mm-hmm. And so you can see that by our av- advocacy in the city. So I yeah. scroll down the roster for the Portland Timbers, and I see many players coming from south america especially oh sure and quite a few foreign players a couple of european players what what is it for the athlete coming in from uh a, let's say just south america or or um or latin america and and they're coming into portland how how does the city feel to them like in your interactions as a chaplain is this is this a, a strange environment for them to walk into with, with sort of the history of Portland and, and who they are and where they come from? Or 
uh, speak a little bit to how, I mean, does the city embrace them? Like share a little bit about that. You know, Brad, I think that's really a, a great question. And, and one of the things that's been surprising to me is of all the players that I've worked with throughout the years, um, I actually feel like the I had, the player I had that was like from Oklahoma had more cultural shock in Portland than any of the international players. Like I think in 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 other parts of the of the world, um, people um, they resonate with Portland because it's a it's a very communal town. We support each other. We care about others. We're trying to to look out for one another. So it's a little less of the American dream of um, individual freedoms, what's best for me and my rights, and a little bit more about the we and the community. And so I think when you get people from other cultures, they come in and they really feel, they feel one, they feel loved and supported because there's not a lot of other, you know, cities they can go to and as an MLS player, maybe even be recognized. And they, and these guys get recognized on the streets. And that's a big deal. So one, they feel like, wow, this city really supports their team and they know their players and they know me and they know my, I mean, they know everything about me, which is both cool and creepy, but, um, <laughs> so I think one, they feel loved and, and supported, but then two, I think that maybe we have a little bit more of a, I don't know, European feel or, um, in the sense that we're not quite as like, America, my freedoms first over yours uh, mentality, um, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. So, so what you're saying is, is a foreign player coming in, it feels almost maybe more like home in some ways. It feels, and, and certainly I would say even the soccer environment probably helps that with just the number of fans you guys have and the sort of the soccer culture that goes on in a game day. But, but outside of that, these guys feel connected to, into the community and, and they feel, they feel a part of this, uh, what's going on in soccer city. Totally. hundred percent. Hmm. Wow. Um, Ben, Christina Garber was the, the, you know, our, our chaplain for the thorn. She was on uh, a few weeks ago and she shared this and, and I'm not sure I'm trying to stir the pot here, but maybe I will a little bit. She said, that the Thorns, the Portland Thorns, the women's team, is the heartbeat of Portland. And so um, now that's coming from her perspective. You, you might disagree with that, but but I wonder if if the Thorns are the heartbeat of Portland, what would you say <laughs> the the Timbers are? Oh man, Brad, I don't know. That's a, I mean, that's a great <laughs> question because because you also have the Trailblazers here, which are just as beloved as anything. Like I. I think what's funny is like people in Portland really, they love their teams and they get into it. And I, I mean, you know, I, I think it's, it's great that Christina is saying the thorns are the heartbeat of, of Portland. I, I, I would um, venture to guess you could make that same argument that the Timbers are, but we don't pit ourselves against the, our, each other either. Like we fully support the thorns um, and they fully support the Timbers and it, you, you, I'm not joking that you go to a Thorns match and, and you're going to find every single one of the Timbers players there watching. Like they go to the matches, they take their families, um, they support the Thorns in the in the in the town. And and you have Blazers players coming to Timbers matches, and you have Timbers guys going to Blazers, and and vice versa. Like, um, so I think we just think of ourselves like the city of Portland. Like our sports teams are our heartbeat for sure. Yeah. Well, I I rem so I. I'm going to share a little bit. I, I used to be a Phoenix Suns fan. And, I mean, a, a, a Suns Trail Blazers matchup was, like, the matchup, right, back in the day. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Kevin Johnson and those guys taking on uh, Clyde Drexler and uh, and crew. Terry uh, Porter. It, yeah. yeah. It was, they were always classic matchups. And, and I think, unfortunately, we came out on the, the losing end more often than, than on the winning side of things. But I just remember there being – sort of that sense like you would watch the trailblazer uh, game happen and and it just felt like it felt like they were playing a basketball game in someone's living room it just felt like the people were just like right at home and the trailblazers were their 
were their kids that they loved, you know, and they loved to cheer for them and chant for them. And um, I remember that even as a kid growing up. And and so you're saying that kind of atmosphere pervades across all the sort of Portland professional teams. There's just sort of this, hey, you're part of our family. We're all part of the same family. We all, and, and we all love going and, and watching and supporting each other. Well, and, you know, back in, in the days um, the Blazers played in um, Veterans Memorial Coliseum or whatever, and they and it only – it only had like 12,000 or 13,000 seats. So it really was like you're in the living room. It was a really small place. So it, I mean, it would get packed and um, it felt really, you know, tight and intense. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, Portland, we averaged 20,000 fans for a women's soccer match. Um, the, oh, it's the wow. most well attended, um, you know, women's professional sports team in the world. Um, yeah. So wow. know, we just, we just love love our teams, um, and it's a fun thing to rally behind, and um, it means a lot to, to the people here. Yeah. So, Ben, uh, Portland tonight, they've got a, a huge matchup at 8 Eastern tonight. They're, they're playing in the MLS's back tournament, and uh, you and Troy, you, you guys have had some moments to – share and speak life and love and truth into the, to the athletes and, and maybe even some of the coaches and staff while they're down in Orlando as, as a chaplain, what does that, what is ministry during the COVID MLS is back tournament bubble season? What does that look like? Yeah. As a chaplain, you know, it's really exciting when, when the team's doing well, just because I'm a fan, just like anybody else in the sense that like, I, I love these guys. I, I want them to do well. Um, and so it's exciting when, when they're, they're, um, they're getting the wins and they're, and they're advancing. And, and so sure we'll be tuned in and cheering them on and, and excited to see how they do. And, but at the same time, like I really see, um, uh, my role and Troy and I, we see our role as um, that to be a servant to the team. And so we just try to stay consistent and make ourselves available, um, dive into scripture and, and have that be a part of, um, the guy's lives. Um, so they, they're having a connection point with other pe- other believers and, and, and a connection point to, um, to Jesus. And then, um, you know, let them go do their jobs. And hopefully, you know, they um, find some success in the process. Well, Ben, I have to ask, in the 10 years of doing the Portland Timbers chaplaincy and working in that environment, what would you say uh, the highlight for you is in in that time yeah brad that's a i mean a great question I, I, there's lots of highlights right i mean um getting to be a part of a uh nls cup you know winning team um and and getting to see the the guys that you that you work with and and the coaches and the families and everything have that you know pinnacle moment of success is, is really special and and so, you know, 2015 will go down as a really special year. Um, but then, you know, there's just these moments throughout the last 10 years where, um, and I, I, you know, I really take confidentiality seriously. So I, you know, I don't want to go into specifics, but, but there are, there have been moments where there's been interactions with people who you, whether they're having a hard time or something's going on in their lives and you just, you feel like, um, for whatever reason, you God uses you to 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 be the right person for for them at the right season of their life, and and so you just know that um, even the hard times where you're like, man, I've just stood in this tunnel for you know 35 straight matches and and said good luck and have a good game and whatever, and you feel like, why am I here? Is this making a difference? And then something comes out of the um, out of the blue, and somebody reaches out because they know you're consistent and faithful to be there. And those moments um, have been really rewarding um, for me to know that um, that if God's a faithful God and God always is there for me, that if I can model that and just be always there for these guys, that um, that they'll feel that love and they'll feel the love of Christ. Um, through my presence and through our stewardship of just being that consistent person. And so that's, there's been great moments where uh, we've had some ministry moments like that, that um, have definitely made the the investment of time and the sacrifice away from, from my own family um, 
a worthwhile experience for sure. I think people, you know, and I'm, I'm going to jump in one more thing. I think a lot of people think um, it's a glamorous thing to get to be a chaplain for a professional sports team because professional sports are sexy, right? Like that's a, that's one of those top yeah. five things yeah. the kid says they want to be when they grow up. <laughs> they want to be, you know, a, um, a fireman or a, a professional soccer player or, you know, like that, that's just one of those things that you've always, people have always wanted to do. And, and, and it's, but man, it's a tough, it's a tough life. And I don't think people realize like you're plucked from your community. You're dropped off in another community. You're a commodity that's traded based on whether you're giving what the team needs or not. And as soon as you're not, you're out the door. Um, you're, if you're not in the top 11, every match, then your insecurities are set in, you're wondering, you have doubts and job stability. And, um, you know, you, you might move in five years, you might live in five different cities and trying to do that with having a family or kids. It's just, it is really, really hard. And so I think people underestimate, they think of it as like this glamorous thing. And so I think they equally think of like, Oh, a pro sports team chaplain must be this glamorous thing. And, and while trust me, there's some cool aspects of it. For the most part, you're spending a lot of time just, um, you know, in, in very unglamorous situations doing unglamorous yeah. things. And so, um, yeah, I don't do it because it's, um, it's this, um, pristine glamorous position. I, I do it because I feel like God, um, has placed, um, a burden for the city on my heart. And this is a connection point for me through the other work that I'm doing in the city around sports to be able to open up and have conversations around how, um, God, God loves people. God loves me. And it's a way for me to share that love. Um, and I think sports is a, is, um, is just such an important aspect for people, sport and leisure and exercise. And, and so I just think it's such a wonderful thing that God's given us. Um, and so being able to use that as a, a way to point people to God is so, so precious. And I'm so um, thankful for that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. You know, as you were, as you were talking, Ben, like, I, I just think your point, you're spot on. It, it's, it's, Truer words were never spoken by a chaplain. I mean, th there are those special moments. And a lot of times people ask me, they, they say, you know, what's a highlight? And I go, hey, 2010 was a special year. Uh, I had twins born to my family and, and the Rapids won the MLS Cup. Um, but I think that the, the more special place sometimes as a chaplain is when you're, you're sitting in the pit with someone you're, um, you're walking with them through the valley of the shadow of death, so to speak, or, mm -hmm. or you're just in that place where after years of faithfulness, after years of perseverance, someone comes and, and a light bulb has gone off for them or, or they've reached out maybe in desperation, or maybe, maybe they're at the end of their own selves and they, they say, chaplain or Rev, or they, whatever that term is, you know, maybe just a first name, hey, hey, Brad, hey, Ben, and they reach across this huge divide where um, y you didn't know, like you said, you don't know if your presence is, is even being effective or noticed, and, and there's a lot of, a lot of difficult times that a chaplain can go through, but being that faithful presence, um, it, it, there's some special moments when you, when we get a chance to serve people and love on them. And, uh, and those are, uh, those are some special moments and special times. Well, Hey Ben, want to thank you for coming on to the podcast today. Want to, want to ask you to end it today though, for us by, uh, would you mind praying, uh, over the timbers, um, pray for the game tonight, but pray also for the city of Portland and uh, would you just kind of give us a blessing as we go away? I'd be happy to. And thanks, Brad, for all you do. You've been um, a very consistent um, person in my life. And I'm just really grateful for your, your mentorship and your leadership, uh, for your faithfulness in running Soccer Chaplains United. And uh, so it's just really been, it's just been fun to, to not only get to partner with you through this, but to call you a friend. And so um, just, you know, 
keep going, you know, and keep doing what you're doing because it's making an impact. So, uh, yeah, let me, let me pray. Um, Father God, we're just so grateful for the time and I appreciate, um, people taking time out of their lives to tune in and, and, and God, we just ask and pray a blessing over the, the Portland Timbers, um, whether you know, all the way from their, their, their front office to their players, to the families, um, to the trainers. God, we just um, pray a blessing over the team. God, I pray for um, any anything that's going on in people's hearts on the team, their lives, whether there be conflict or struggle. Uh, we're all going through this global pandemic. We're all experiencing racial um, unrest right now. And so, God, I just pray that leadership will emerge, um, that the players on the team would use their platform um, to, to bring about social change in a positive way, to, to really be the king of God here on earth. Um, God, I pray for um, any player on the team who's, who's wrestling with um, doubts or um, unbelief or uncertainties about your presence and your love for them, God, that they would just come to know you in a new and greater way. Um, God, I pray for our city. Our city is under siege. We're under attack. God, and we just pray that um, that cooler heads would prevail and that there would be um, leadership emerge because we're in a city that has a lot of different interests, a lot of special interests, God, and we need somebody that can unify us, Lord. Um, and, the, and the Timbers... And the sports teams have a way to unify um, like no other thing in our cities, God. So I pray that somehow, some way, there would be some leadership emerge in our city to help us find um, peace. Um, We have a very conflicted um, um, city right now, God. So I pray for peace in our city. Um, God, and I pray for um, everyone that's that's struggling right now um, through coronavirus, through the pandemic. God, that you would give them internal peace as well um, in their heart to help them to know and to lean and count on you. Uh, Because that's all, that's the one thing we know we have. That's the one thing we know we can count on is your presence and your love. So let us lean on that. Let us lean on your hope and your understanding, God, and and, um, and stay as positive as we can moving forward. So we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, this is Rev Brad and Ben Dudley coming to you from the touchline.